Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy's first ever summer education series. We're grateful to have your time and attention for the next hour as we dive into today's session, the last one of our summer series, um, where we will talk about advocacy and how to empower your voice as a peripheral neuropathy patient. All right, before we begin the program, I have three reminders for you. Um, we are recording the session. It will be emailed to you after the program and posted on our website in the coming days. And we'll also make sure to email out the slide deck. So no need to take crazy notes if you don't want to. Um, for those participating in the live session today, we will be holding a question and answer at the end of our time together. So please submit any questions you have that are pertinent to this topic with the questions box within the platform, and we'll try to get to as many as possible before we have to conclude. And lastly, if you're having any type of audio issue, just feel free to dial by phone using the instructions that were sent to your email. Remember, this session is being recorded and you can view it at a later date. All right, my name is Lindsay Colbert. Um, I am proud to serve as Executive Director of the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy, and I'm honored to represent the premier resource for information, research, and advocacy surrounding the individual and collective experiences with PN. Thank you again for tuning in today. Joining me today and presenting later in this program is the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy's lobbyist, who helps us with our advocacy campaign. His name is Mark Veith. Mark is a veteran strategist with more than 34 years of experience in public and government relations services. He manages a diverse portfolio of clients in several practice areas, including public health and medical research. He has specialized in bringing diverse associations, foundations, institutions of higher education, and other stakeholders together to advocate for common, object common objectives. Prior to joining CRD Associates, Mark served for 14 years as a professional staff member in the House of Representatives. As Chief of Staff for Congressman Robert Borsky, Mark worked extensively on a wide range of health, higher education, and economic and urban development issues. Since 2015, Mark has also served as the coordinator of the Defense Health Research Consortium, a coalition of organizations advocating for the congressionally directed medical research programs. But before I bring Mark in, I want to talk a little bit about the history of the Foundation's role in advocating for peripheral neuropathy, highlighting some of our accomplishments with the Department of Defense and also with the National Institutes of Health, and the amazing successes of these campaigns, which I think really need to be celebrated in our community. So first, what I want to talk about is why are we doing this? What is our advocacy, what is our advocacy program and why are we doing it? So for five, over five years, we have been advocating for public policies that support research and treatment advances for, for peripheral neuropathy. That is our end game, right? We are trying to find more answers, more treatments, and hopefully one day cures. We're working with federal and state legislators um, to help also afford, have access to affordable care. And all of these efforts have seriously led to significant funding increases for research. We have um, been eligible through the Department of Defense's program for funding, and it's resulted in millions of dollars for research grants for peripheral neuropathy. And we're also strengthening our relationship with the National Institutes of Health, which is our country's largest biomedical research funding agency. So we're in the right spots. All right. Um, oh, so in 2020, we were finally included, peripheral neuropathy was finally included as an eligible condition for funding. And this is important because out of 42 conditions that received eligibility, it allowed our researchers to submit proposals to get grant money. And in the first year alone, we had 41 applications that were submitted for peripheral neuropathy and $8 million were awarded in funding for peripheral neuropathy research that year. And I think that that's so amazing and so cool um, because honestly, our organization alone could not have funded that amount of research. And here are the exact research um, programs and projects that were funded that year. All of this also lives on our website, but it's really cool to see all the institutions that got involved, the projects and the award amount through the Department of Defense. 
Um, the following year, we also got eligible, right? So we 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 were able to to, to keep our eligibility as um, a condition for funding, and we received 4.6 million dollars. And um, I'm going to just quickly kind of show you here are the three projects that were awarded in the fiscal year of 2022 and the amounts. Um, and again, you're going to see a lot of things are specific about treatments, trying to find better understanding of um, what peripheral neuropathy is, why it's happening, and trying to find a better course of treatment action and action in hopes for cures. The following year, again, we were renewed, we were eligible, um, and we received over $3.5 million. And when I say we, it's not actually the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy, it's just peripheral neuropathy. So these are all grants that are awarded directly from the Department of Defense's peer-reviewed medical research program, and they are funded, um, they are then funding the the best research projects. Um, and thankfully, um, peripheral neuropathy is eligible. And here are a couple, a few of the programs that were awarded in fiscal year 2023. So we were once again renewed this current year. Um, applications just closed and there are peer reviewers that are already reviewing all the proposals. This is what's really cool about the system is, so researchers submit their proposals, the proposals then get in the hands of the Department of Defense, and we have a team um, that actually gets nominated by our organization, by me with the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy to say, hey, who is a patient that is impacted by peripheral neuropathy and wants to read more as a lay person to give advice on if they feel that this research proposal is gonna move the needle in finding more answers for peripheral neuropathy and, and, and finding those treatments. Um, so peer reviewers are already underway reviewing the research proposals. I actually don't know how many have been submitted to date. Um, they usually don't let you know that until the end of the program when everything kind of gets reviewed and approved. And then we get notified how many peripheral neuropathy projects are funded through their um, program. And then we can share the great news. Um, so if you are interested um, in ever becoming a peer reviewer, reach out to us at the foundation and I can tell you a little bit more about it. It's a really great opportunity. It's intense. You have to read research proposals, um, but you get to play a role in the research that could possibly get funded, which I think is really cool. So moving on to the National Institutes of Health, as I mentioned, this is kind of our the second layer of our advocacy program. Um, we've been doing it for several years and finally just two years ago, very exciting news. We you know, we were acknowledged ultimately as peripheral neuropathy was acknowledged as important for research. Um, not saying that it wasn't before, but unless you're not advocating for it, you're not going to kind of get taken seriously, I think. So that's our role at the organization is advocating for it so that they hear us, they hear the patient voice, and they know that it is important. So it was really exciting when we got acknowledged um, in the Committee on Appropriations. And um, just this past year, we got another layer of acknowledgement. We were approved um, in the fiscal year 2024 Labor, Health and Human Services Education Appropriations Act. And um, the committee's report also included um, and encouraged the NIH to develop, and I quote, a coordinated approach to peripheral neuropathy research. I wanna remind everyone that how our government is working is the National Institutes of Health will only do it if it comes from higher up in the government. So when the committee told them that they need to take a coordinated approach for peripheral neuropathy research, that was huge because it allowed me and, and our lobbyists to have a lot more conversations with them about the gaps of peripheral neuropathy. And this is what I'm showing on this slide right here, which is really, there are recommendations on what the national institutions of health should focus on, um, which includes developing a natural history database. That is currently what we are doing here at the organization with our peripheral neuropathy research registry, which is a natural history database, a biobank of human samples um, to be used for research. Um, we want to study blood, blood biomarkers. Um, we want to do tissue banks. 
Um, all of this allows researchers to get a better understanding of what peripheral neuropathy is. Um, identifying genetic risk factors, right? Is peripheral neuropathy genetic? Can you pass it down? So really understanding what those risk factors are. And, and most importantly, right, our job and our role as this organization is to try to push the needle to find more answers so that we have better understanding of diagnoses and better options for treatments for all of you until those, you know, those cures are, 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 are right around the corner. And the committee also urged in this report for the National Institutes of Health to support research on idiopathic neuropathy, um, which affects 10 million Americans. And I wanna remind everyone that idiopathic means it's an unknown cause. Um, so this is also really great because it allows um, the NIH to really focus on a, a large percentage of patients who have neuropathy that don't understand the cause. And that's half the battle, I think, in, in the diagnosis and understanding how you can make your symptoms a little bit under control better. So again, this was just a quick kind of overview of some of the history of what the foundation is doing, what our lobbyist Mark Veith, who I'm gonna invite to join right now, has helped us to achieve, and kind of the power of advocacy, all those research dollars and the attention through the DOD and through the NIH that we're getting is really exciting. And Mark, welcome, thank you so much. Thanks, Lindsay. Great to, uh, what a great overview of uh, our accomplishments. In many ways, we're, we're doing this kind of in reverse order. We're talking about what we've accomplished, and now I'll uh, tell you a little bit about how we accomplished that and how we can keep things going. Uh, so really appreciate the, uh, the introduction, Lindsay, and it's been a, an honor to work with uh, the foundation. Uh, it's really a great organization. Uh, all these accomplishments happen because of advocates like you. Uh, it's been a team approach of, of grassroots advocates, of the staff at the foundation and board members and the medical and scientific experts as well. Yeah. So uh, let me, first of all, make sure I can advance the slides here. There we go. Uh, and I'm gonna go off camera so that you don't have to look at me. Um, these are, th these are the goals that I want to achieve today with you. Um, I really, first and foremost, want you to be comfortable with the idea uh, that Congress works for you and that uh, Congress responds to its constituents. It rarely does anything proactively without the input of the people that they represent. Uh, I know you hear a lot about gridlock when you uh, watch the news and it can be uh, very easy to become cynical about the legislative process, but actually there are things that can be done and are done because of uh, efforts by grassroots advocates and uh, a bipartisan approach by Congress to getting things done. So, this is our agenda. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna talk about who, who ad the advocates are. Who are, what is our community? Who, who are the advocates? And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the climate that we're currently in. Um, that will be followed by our requests for this year that we're working on. And then I'm gonna to talk to you about the different ways that you can communicate with your elected officials in Congress and how to have, uh, if you have opportunities to meet with your members of Congress or staff, how to have a good meeting. So first and foremost, who are our advocates? Uh, they are patients and family members, just like you. Uh, but they're also researchers. We really tap into our research community. Uh, they really have great expertise in explaining the kind of work that they're doing and the goals they're trying to achieve through these research grants uh, uh, through the PRMRP. And, and last but not least, it's also the staff at the foundation, the folks like Lindsay and her team, as well as the board members around the country who uh, are very engaged with their members of Congress. So this is the climate uh, that we're currently operating in. I don't need to tell you that we are in an election year. Boy, are we in an election year. Uh, it's been quite dramatic and eventful. Um, the stakes are very high. The, uh, the, 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 you know, the control of Congress is really up in the air. Both the presidency and Congress, it's about a 50-50, uh, you know, synopsis of whether uh, Democrats or Republicans will control any, either of those bodies. Uh, we're also dealing with some 
very significant international challenges. Uh, the war in Ukraine continues to frame a lot of the, the work that Congress is doing, as well as uh, the budget and the expenditures uh, that Congress is making, as well as the conflict in Israel and the Middle East. And uh, the border issues also are continue to dominate uh, the debate in, in Congress. We're also, uh, once again, in a budget stalemate. It seems like we're always in a budget stalemate. Uh, we only just approved uh, last year's budget. Well, actually, it's really this year's. It's the fiscal year uh, 24 budget. We only just approved that a couple months ago. Uh, so Congress got a late start on the current fiscal 25 budget. And uh, we have a lot of members retiring this year. 50 members of Congress, including seven senators and 43 representatives, are not seeking reelection in 2024. So we're going to have a very new Congress as well as a new president next year. So let me kind of uh, give you an overview of our requests, and they're relatively simple, and, and Lindsay really has already covered this, um, but we are trying to renew the designation of peripheral neuropathy in the PRMRP. We use a lot of acronyms here in, in, the, in Washington, D.C., um, but you know, PRMRP is a, a subset of a larger program called the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, and a lot of people don't realize that uh, every year Congress adds funding to the defense appropriations bill, about $1.5 billion over the president's request for various uh, medical issues and, and, uh, and research. And uh, it is really the only place where Congress designates uh, specific conditions for funding. So peripheral neuropathy has for the last five years been part of this larger program called the PRMRP that's currently funded at $370 million. And even though we've been uh, included for five years in a row in the PRMRP, doesn't mean we're automatically going to get renewed. We have to ask for this every year. We have to advocate for it every year. We have to have at least one senator submit the request formally to the Appropriations Committee to even be considered. So uh, this is not something that's on autopilot just because it was done five years in a row. We have to do this every single year. Uh, the other interesting and unique aspect of this program is that it's only funded through the Senate. Don't ask me why, but that's the way it's been done for, for decades. Uh, the PRMRP, the designations and the funding levels are only included in the Senate's version of the Defense Appropriations Act. It is not included in the House's version. So we really focus our, uh, our lobbying efforts primarily on the Senate, we really focus on our Senate. Uh, we also asked for, you know, as Lindsay covered, increased funding for peripheral neuropathy at the National Institutes of Health. And this gets a little tricky and a little nuanced because unlike the defense bill, Congress does not include specific levels of funding for specific diseases at the NIH. Uh, so you'll never see a line item in there that says $5 million for peripheral neuropathy. Uh, just not the way that Congress does it. They want to give a lot of wide latitude to the NIH to, through the peer review process, to determine where the dollars go for specific diseases. What they do is they include something that's called report language, which is uh, something that Lindsay um, shared with you, the report language that we most recently got in, in, in last year's appropriations bill. And that language at least provides some direction to NIH to coordinate efforts among the various institutes. So that's about as much as you can do. We also ask for increased funding for NIH. It's important that the overall agency uh, continue to grow to, uh, to meet the demand for research. So uh, this is my very crude chart that shows you how this appropriations process works. Remember that we're working with, with two bills. Uh, it's the labor Health and Human Services Bill, and that's what funds the National Institutes of Health, and the Defense Bill, uh, DOD, which funds the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, uh, which includes the PRMRP. So the legislative process, uh, as you probably remember from your high school civics classes, uh, the bill, bills first start at a subcommittee level and the appropriations committees in both the House and the Senate. They then go to uh, the full committee level, and then they're brought to the floor of the House. This is how it's supposed to work, but uh, as often happens with gridlock and running out of time, 
a lot of this gets circumvented and sometimes things go straight to that conference committee that I have on the bottom of the slide. That's where the House and the Senate put together their final versions of these bills. And then once they do that, of course, it has to be cleared by both the House and the Senate and then ultimately goes to the president for signature. So um, what is the best way for you to communicate with Congress? Uh, really, the best thing to do is if you can, come to Washington, D.C., and we're happy to coordinate that with you uh, through the foundation. Uh, Congress is open again uh, for business after COVID, so uh, there are a lot of uh, organizations that bring their advocates up to Capitol Hill for in-person meetings with their members of Congress and staff. And by the way, staff are very important in this process. They do most of the real work and uh, the, the staff have the ear of the congressman that they work for. So if you make a compelling case to the staff member, you really have made a, a, the case to the, to the member of Congress. You can also meet with your members of Congress in their state and district offices back home uh, and can meet with staff there as well. Uh, I often find that uh, folks that do that have a little more of a relaxed setting in those meetings. It's a little more, uh, it's a little less formal. Uh, so it's a, definitely something that I recommend. Um, you can still do meetings uh, and we still continue to do a lot of meetings by, by Zoom and Teams, uh, the virtual meetings. Um, but if you can't do any of that, even just emailing uh, your letters to, to Congress, and we, we're not asking you to do that now. There is a time and place for that. It's usually at the beginning of the year when Congress starts its appropriations process. Uh, we do uh, send out sample letters that you can use, and we're gonna ask you to do that again uh, early next year as well. But another thing you can do uh, between now and uh, election day is, look, the members of Congress are gonna be back home quite a bit uh, between now and election day. They're, they're out campaigning, they're doing public events. If you get a chance to go to any of these events, Take the time to go up to them afterwards and introduce yourself and say, hey, I have this condition called peripheral neuropathy. You may have never heard of this, but more than 30 million Americans are affected by this. And we are trying to get more funding for research uh, through both NIH and the Department of Defense. Can you help us with this? So that is a good way in, in this interim period until the final budget is done to, to really make that connection and start forging that relationship with, with your member of Congress and their staff. So if you do get a chance to, to meet with your members of Congress in person, the most important thing you can do is telling your personal story. You are not expected to be an expert on the legislative process. No one is, I'll tell you, even I am not an expert on it. I know some things, but it's always changing. But uh, you know how peripheral neuropathy affects you. That's where you, have, you are the expert. And that's something you need to share with them, uh, share the personal story of what you're going through, or what a family member is going through. Uh, then you will certainly want to educate them about what peripheral neuropathy is, and we have lots of resources on, on our website, uh, and educate them about uh, our, our programs uh, that, uh, that we're advocating for that I just overviewed. Uh, get to the asks and uh, make sure they are supportive of those asks. Um, use visuals if it's a family member. Uh, don't get sidetracked, and I'll go over some ways that you can get sidetracked. Explain things in um, simple terms. Remember that uh, uh, typically, if you're a researcher, uh, remember that these staff members do not have a degree in, in uh, advanced sciences. They, chances are they are political scientists. So make sure you, you explain things in, in layman's terms. Uh, you may also get a, a, a question that you can't answer, and that often happens. Uh, don't try to BS it. Uh, write it down and get back to the foundation. And one of us can get back to that staff member to answer that question. And it's always good to get uh, the business card so that you can follow up with them. And you know, anytime you have a, a, a meeting with a member or staff, it's good, take, a, take a photo of it, send it to the foundation. We can, we can share it on social media. You can send it to your local newspaper. Uh, there are many ways to, to promote this, this activity. Um, and uh, we really encourage you to do that. So here are some potential diversions if you're having a meeting. Uh, you know, politics is on everybody's mind, but it's really important to note that this is a bipartisan cause, really a nonpartisan cause. It has nothing to do with who's running for president, who's going to control Congress. Um, this is Democrats and Republicans alike suffer from peripheral neuropathy. 
Um, drug pricing is still a, a, a common uh, issue that, and, and the thing that I've seen in, in meetings where folks want to have a more detailed discussion on drug pricing. Uh, we do not take any positions on that. You may have your own personal opinion, but really leave it out of the meeting. Same with immigration, international affairs. And of course, everybody's talking about Taylor Swift and the Olympics too. So uh, try to avoid uh, getting down those rabbit holes as well. Uh, lastly, I'm just going to leave you with, uh, you know, I've, I've told you about how to have a good meeting, but here are some things that you don't want to do when you have a meeting. Don't be hostile or threatening. Um, you, you may be meeting with a member of Congress or staff person who is completely on the opposite side of where you are politically. Again, I would just want to say over and over again, these are uh, nonpartisan issues, so leave, leave those hostilities at the door. Uh, you can't give gifts uh, you, as much as you might want to take a staff member out for, a, for lunch, uh, they will not accept that. There's a very strict gift ban in Congress. Members in con Congress and staff are not allowed to accept meals. Don't suggest cutting other disease research. And boy, I have seen this before. Um, you can always make comparisons to, you know, a, a, a disease that may be less prevalent but is getting more funding. But if you suggest cutting those things, um, you're really going, you're asking for trouble uh, because you never know what kind of connection that member of Congress might have with that other disease. Uh, don't engage in political arguments. I've already covered that. And uh, maybe you are a contributor to your, your member of Congress or to a candidate. Uh, don't mention that in these meetings. There's a very firm wall of separation between official business and the political side. So uh, don't even mention you gave a check for $100 to your congressman just don't mention it. It will end the meeting right away. So with that, uh, I think we can open things up for questions. I'll go back on camera here. And uh, maybe Lindsay will want to come back. There she is. Yeah, no, your, your do's and don'ts. I, I, I especially liked your don'ts. Yeah. <laughs> I was chuckling. <laughs> in the well, that's why I put it on there. I wouldn't put it on there if I didn't see it in my, in my time of doing this. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's a, it is important. I feel like, um, you know, when you're trying to, when you have an agenda and you're trying to get someone to help you out, right? Like it just, it's common sense, but sometimes you need to get that reminder. So thank you so much. And, and the one thing that I left out, Lindsay, um, it just, this, the timing of this webinar is great because it just so happens that the Senate today in the, in the uh, Senate Appropriations Committee, they just had a big markup where they, they approved a number of their appropriations bills, and they have actually approved the defense bill and the labor HHS bill just an hour ago. Oh uh, my goodness. We, yeah, we have not seen it yet. I, I don't have any news to share about <laughs> specifically about peripheral neuropathy. We we may see it later today. Okay. Um, they actually did a, a very bipartisan about the Senate has taken a much more bipartisan approach to passing these spending bills, whereas the House and this is typical. The House is much more partisan. Uh, they ran okay. just through, uh, you know, the, the majority's viewpoint. So. Okay. Yeah. No. Well, that's great news. Um, yeah. yeah. I think, kind of since you know, over the last five years since we've been working with you, Mark, I think we've really seen kind of that upward trajectory and trend. Um, so I would love to ask, kind of, right, like if if we can keep going on this trajectory. What are your thoughts on kind of like our next steps? Like what should we be adding into our agenda or um, focusing on in the coming years? Because I am confident we're gonna, we're gonna keep re re receiving the eligibility the way we're, you know, I, I, I think it's important. I think they hear it. Um, and, you know, we're making progress with the NIH and, and getting them to pay attention to, to neuropathy research as well. So, right, other than, obviously continuing these efforts, which I don't want to minimize. I think it's so important and it it, it shows just the, the amount of successes that we can and con will continue to have. But do you have any other thoughts on what else kind of we should be doing either as us as the organization or, you know, us as kind of our, our patient network? Yeah, I mean, I think in the short term, we continue doing what we're doing. Um, it is uh, the fiscal environment right now is probably at its most challenging since I've been doing this for 30 years. Uh, it is really hard to grow things and create new things in this environment. And playing defense, first and foremost, is is probably your main objective. Protecting what you have is, yep. is a 
definitely important. However, uh, looking down the road, I'm hoping that things can improve. And if if there are opportunities for if Congress is looking to grow the congressionally directed medical research program at DOD, um, you know, I would love to, and we talked about this internally, love to see a, a specific program set aside for peripheral neuropathy with a specific level of funding, you know, even starting at $5 million and growing to $10 million would just be huge. Having a dedicated program uh, would, I think, um, attract more researchers into this yeah. field if they know that there's a place where they can go every year to get potential funding. So, uh, or, or even, you know, a, more of a, a pain initiative, maybe a larger pain initiative that uh, would be at DOD. Pain is, is an incredibly important aspect, and everybody is talking about it with the, the recent opioid uh, epidemic, but no one seems to be doing, making those big pushes to, uh, particularly on the defense spending side, to address pain. So uh, I'd love to catch that wave if it ever happens. Um, and there's just a lot that we still need to do with the National Institutes of Health. A lot of it is, is it's not so much involving grassroots adv advocacy, it's more involving folks like Lindsay and I and our, our medical researchers and our board members, where we really burrow deep into the various institutes to see where we can be playing and where yeah. they can do more research. So yeah, that's, that's kind of what I, I see as next steps. Yeah, and you know, could you share a little bit more information about maybe another um, disease condition that has a dedicated program and what that could look like for us. I sometimes yeah. feel like kind of okay. looking at another sample and kind of going, oh, that would be so cool if that was us. Would you, sure. um, I, kn I know <laughs> putting you on the spot here, but could no, you give no, us an no, example? Not at all. <laughs> no, I'd be happy to. I can actually give you two examples in the cancer world um, because I work with both uh, pancreatic cancer and kidney cancer. Uh, okay. uh, patient groups. And so there's a similar program to the PRMRP called the PRCRP. We, we love our acronyms here, Peer Review Cancer Research Program. And it kind of worked the same way as the Peer Review Medical Research Program, except it included maybe a dozen or so cancer conditions in one pot of funding. Okay. So kidney cancer and pancreatic cancer used to be in those, those pot, that pot of funding called the PRCRP. Through advocacy, through incredible advocacy and hard work, both of those conditions graduated out of the PRCRP to have their own funding lines. Um, kidney cancer is now a $50 million program. Uh, at and In just a couple of years, it was grown to $50 million. That's now, it helps that the chair of the Appropriations Committee at the time uh, had a personal interest in this, and she, she fought really hard for those increases. Uh, but same with pancreatic cancer. A couple of years ago, it graduated up and is now a $15 million program. And the number of applications that were submitted to these programs, uh, you know, increased tenfold. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible. That it, it was a game changer. So that's why yeah. I love this with peripheral neurology. Yeah, now I'm I'm very jealous. Um, <laughs> no, it, but that that is that's that's the next step. And I think when you had mentioned, you know, they had a champion within, um, which is huge. I mean, couldn't you agree? Like we must have. I mean, we already do have a lot of champions for our current efforts, but to take it to the next level, um, just because peripheral neuropathy impacts so many people, um, including President Joe Biden himself, yeah. right? Like right. to kind of have that have that voice and um that would be huge to get us to that to that next i would i would yeah. love my own pot I, I i do i don't like sharing yeah. sometimes right <laughs> i feel like i'm popular. i don't want to share <laughs> well if we graduate out we can leave more money for the other conditions that are in there so you yeah know. actually true yeah it's a win-win uh, you know i i think what works against us is that um you know peripheral neuropathy is not considered a, a killer it, it, it doesn't kill people like cancer does. Thankfully, it uh, doesn't, but yes. Yeah, thankfully, but it also, you know, it makes it, I think in the eyes of policymakers, it's less critical to increase resources for something where you're not saving lives. Yeah. Uh, it's not, and particularly if it's children. I mean, children are at the top, right, in the consideration of policymakers. Yeah. Any, childhood cancer is like the number one thing that 
Yes. So, uh, but but elderly too. I mean, and and so I think because we have a lot of older Americans with peripheral neuropathy, maybe we can get some tra traction there. But uh, someday, yeah. We'll get you know, and I think this also reminds me, which is somewhat on topic. I mean, ad advocacy, right? We're talking about advocacy, but our our organization also advocates for awareness, right? And I think that is a huge campaign as well to kind of highlight the impacts of neuropathy that it is a secondary condition which is good but it's also bad because it's not the primary focus and sometimes quality of life doesn't get as front of stage um as we all know that it needs to um yeah, so yeah so we're we're really doing a lot of work here um you know there was a question about kind of what other organizations do we work with um, to, to help kind of create this kind of community? Um, and we do, right? Obviously, we are our own organization, but at the end of the day, we're a patient advocacy group that works with other patient advocacy groups in the neuropathy space. Um, in fact, I was just, um, I was going to say last month, but it's officially August 1st today. Um, but in June, um, I was at a Peripheral Neuropathy Society annual meeting. and all of the peripheral neuropathy research leaders attend there. It's a great way to kind of learn about research updates and to collaborate on next steps and next projects and, and possible new research projects. But it's also an opportunity for patient advocacy groups to come together and talk about what are you doing? What are your successes? What kind of hurdles did you overcome? And it's an opportunity to talk about what works, what doesn't work. Um, you learn so much about it. Why reinvent the wheel? And I think what we're trying to do at our organization and within our advocacy campaign too is work with these other patient advocacy groups to kind of empower the voice of the patient because right there are other groups that work in our space um, that are specific to specific causes of neuropathy whereas we span across all of the causes um, yep. so it really allows us to touch on specific you know hereditary or, or different inflammatory types of neuropathies that have their own organizations and their own patients and their own voices there and working collaboratively with them, we can kind of climb up that hill together and it becomes a little less steep. And I think that is really important too. And then again, bringing in the researchers, bringing in folks on our organization's medical and scientific advisory board to say, you know, this is what we're seeing in clinic. This is what we're seeing with our patients. This is the research that we're currently doing or that we know is out there. And this is really important and or this is the gap. And I think that allows us to then communicate effectively to these legislators and to, to appropriately lobby so you're actually making a strong case. And I think we've done a brilliant job and um, I'm, always, I'm always happy and I, I love celebrating the successes but I also always want more. So to your to our <laughs> previous conversation, I want I want that pot just for peripheral neuropathy, yeah, and, yeah. and that's something um, that I think together as a community we have an opportunity to achieve. And it might not be tomorrow, but um, you know I think with every step we get closer. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah and um, you know in your introduction of me, you mentioned that I'm the coordinator of the Defense Health Research Consortium. So this is a a group of uh, 50 plus patient advocacy groups, veterans organizations, medical societies, yeah. uh, all with a com working together with a common interest of growing the Congressional yeah. Direct Medical Research Program. If we can't grow that, it's been flat for several years. It's been at about 1.5 billion. If we can't grow that overall program, it's going to be hard to create new things uh, with new sources. Because uh, if if you try to create something new within a static budget, that means somebody else gets cut. So um, so that's yeah. why we all work together and it, it's really important that we continue to grow that overall. And by the way, 1.5 billion uh, in a 800 billion plus defense budget is is peanuts, it's nothing. It, it's a tiny, tiny, it sounds like a lot of money, but it's a tiny amount of the defense budget. You're right, it does sound like a lot of money. I think it's probably because it is a lot of money, but I understand yeah. your point. <laughs> the defense budget really a lot of money <laughs> yeah yeah no that's great um well so um i actually don't have that many other live questions that are coming in right now um i feel like we've probably just done a, an extremely comprehensive presentation so 
maybe bravo to both of us for not having a lot of questions follow, but obviously there is still time for folks that are still online if they have any questions to just plug them into the questions box. Um, as I wait to see just in case one or two more pop up, Mark, is there anything else you want to say in closing to the folks that are a part of our organization that are obviously committed to kind of helping us advocate for peripheral neuropathy and for patients um, to get more research funding, to get more answers? Um, yeah, anything else that you wanted to mention before? Yeah, um, I, I would just say um, be, be persistent. And, um, you know, this time of year is, is a slow time of year. We're, we're about to go into summer and not let not okay. a lot happen. Um, but we're going to get back in touch with, with everybody uh, at the beginning of next year, if not a little sooner. And uh, this work is very seasonal. Like the, You can have the most impact when Congress starts that appropriations process. And uh, again, I mentioned cynicism. It's easy to get very cynical about this process. It's very tough, uh, very difficult. Yeah. But I can't tell you how many times I've seen one person make a difference. Uh, yeah. A constituent who comes into a meeting and asks a member of Congress to sign on to a letter or submit an appropriations request, just one. And uh, a lot of times, you know, the, the, the staff will say, yeah, they'll get back to us and say, because you contacted us about this, we're going to support this. Uh, so one person really can make a difference. And if we get that critical mass of hundreds of advocates doing this, yes, make a difference. Yeah, and you know, I think um, kind of in some of the ways that we've involved our patients um, by, you know, submitting letters and and going to meetings, and there's lots of different opportunities there. Um, yeah, I, I I like hearing that, right? That that one one conversation or one letter really could have such a greater impact than, you know, perhaps just one vote in an election, which you don't feel like really counts, but it does. Um, but I think this counts even more, and that's what I'm trying to highlight. Yeah, you know, that's great. Well, again, Mark, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm confident okay. that our presentation, our short Q&A here, it, it allowed people to kind of hopefully glean some helpful information about how to empower your voice, how to advocate for peripheral neuropathy, because no one else, no one else will, um, except right. for us. Um, so um, I'm gonna bring up um, our slide deck again. I just wanna thank everyone again for, you know, for joining today. Um, I, I do hope that folks are considering making a $25 donation to us so we can continue to, buy, to provide programs like this and expand our mission further um, to, to really help advocate and make a difference for the millions of folks that have peripheral neuropathy. Um, you can use the QR code up on the screen for secure donation right now. Um, just use your smartphone camera. Otherwise, our contact information and website are also listed for your convenience. Um, so again, on behalf of the entire team here at the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy, thank you again, Mark. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, it's been a pleasure. I look forward to our continued work together. And um, have a great day, everyone. Thank you again. Take care, everybody. Have a great summer. Great. Bye. Bye-bye.